This is Duke University. Our second session this morning, uh, we're going to have a lecture by Jonathan Tran, who is Associate Professor of Theology at Baylor University, and a response by Peter Dula, who is Associate Professor of Religion and Culture at Eastern Mennonite University. And the title of Professor Tran's paper is Anne, and the difficult gift of Stanley Hauerwas's church. So, Jonathan. Thank you, Dean Hayes. Um, before I begin, I just want to ask about this. So I know who this guy is. Who is this guy? <laughs> When I first saw this, I had to ask uh, Jennifer and Charlie, you know, is this him? Because I thought it was a young Sean Connery. <laughs> now, the, now, the reason I say that is, I kid you not, one day in Christian ethics in my, you know, second semester here, Dr. Harawas said, I've often thought about getting an earring because, you know, I look so much like Sean Connery. So <laughs> I, I thought to myself, who is this guy? And I find myself asking that once again. <laughs> I wanted to leave that out <laughs> since we are here to honor you. So, Well, I'm very glad for this happy day and very glad to be a part of it. Paula and Stanley, quoting from Colossians, for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have witnessed your hope and the faith that you have in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Stanley, your work has been such that going forward, we will not be able to tell the story of 20th century American theology without mentioning your pivotal role within it. A reality about which I'm sure you don't care. <laughs> In that case, we should simply say, for many of us, 20th century theology came to matter because of you. That is literally the first time I've ever addressed him as Stanley. When as a recent Duke grad, I first started my faculty job at Baylor, Ralph Wood insisted I call him Ralph and not Dr. Wood as the Asian grad student in me dictated. As unnatural as this was, I powered through. And at the very first faculty graduate student colloquium, I called him Ralph. To which he quickly responded, but not in front of the graduate students. Who can make sense of the strange social habits of white people? <laughs> I don't have time this morning to give a full overview of Professor Harawas's work, if such an enterprise is even possible, but only to key in on a particular feature of it. The occasion does oblige me to at least name that broader corpus. And so before I turn to the particular feature that concerns me today, I ought to say something about that. So here it goes. In this good company of people who know about performing the faith, regarding the deep and wide influence of Stanley Hauerwas, one need only say, working with words within the state of the university and now, approaching the end, Stanley Hauerwas, a.k.a. Hannah's child, has been a suffering presence for a better hope as he, without apology, 
calls resident aliens back to a community of character he understands as the cross-shattered church. Oh, I'm only getting started. <laughs> For ask any Harawas reader, including my good friend Matthew. For the theologians in the room, that's a reference to a Bible. <laughs> Ask any uh, Hawass reader, including my good friend Matthew, a companion to Christian ethics. Stanley hasn't exactly been naming the silences. <laughs> As he's written on every conceivable topic from Christianity, democracy, and the radical ordinary, to wilderness wanderings, Harawas, now growing old with the grain of the universe, <laughs> dispatches from the front those who claim war and the American difference, often driving them to God, medicine, and suffering. Preaching the wisdom of the cross in descent from the homeland, Professor Harawas heralds character and the Christian life as a seat of the vision and virtue necessary to ask questions like, should war be eliminated? Praying with prayers plainly spoken that God would sanctify them in the truth, fullness, and tragedy. <laughs> because he believes that schooling Christians on the truth about God entails after Christendom, Christian existence today, unleashing the scriptures against the nations, indeed, where resident aliens live, gently in a violent world as the, as the peaceable kingdom. I spent about 30 hours writing this, <laughs> and most of it was just there. So I do want to say for a person who has authored so many books about what the church does, you sure don't have a lot of active verbs in your titles. <laughs> now that I've summarized all of Professor Harawas' theology, I turn to a much more specific concern. That is, some questions raised by his extraordinary Hannah's Child, a theologian's memoir significant parts of which chronicle his marriage to Anne Hauerwas and her difficulties with bipolar illness. Notre Dame's Gerald McKinney raises one of the most poignant questions asked of the 2010 memoir. In a private letter he gave Hauerwas permission to publicly respond to, Professor McKinney asks, quote, is Anne one of the strange members of the Christian community whose presence with us teaches us how to be Christians? Or is she the surd that resists your story, refusing to be assimilated into it, and therefore reminding you of the limits of any account of Christian discipleship, including yours? My sense is she is the latter, and you did not really let her play that role." End quote. By using the word surd, McKinney means to impress on us the likelihood that Anne Hauerwas, like an irrational number, or a sound for which we cannot account, or an event devoid of meaning, does not fit the story Stanley Hauerwas wants to tell about God. Narrate that story with Anne in it, and it will not add up. We'll leave things unaccounted for will not make sense. Harawas sees McKinney here suggesting, quote, I may well not be aware of how profoundly Anne's life stands as an intractable argument against my theology, end quote. It is no wonder that Professor McKinney confesses he raises his question with fear and trembling. In a 2011 lecture series reflecting on mental illness, Harawas phrased McKinney's challenge this way, quote, McKinney observes that I have written well about how we are able to understand those we label as the mentally handicapped and do so in Christian terms, 
but I do not, nor is it possible for me to do so for those who suffer bipolar illness. At the end of those lectures, Fuller's Nancy Murphy, a longtime friend and reader of Hauerwas, took the question further. She gamely quoted from the 1977 Truthfulness and Tragedy where Hauerwas seemed to admit that there were indeed difficulties that cannot be assimilated into God's redemption, and so therefore proved problematic for the accounts of Christian discipleship for which Hauerwas has become famous. Together, I interpret McKinney and Murphy as saying a couple things. That Anne Hauerwas is a surd to the story Hauerwas tells of the church, and that Anne Hauerwas is a surd to the story Hauerwas tells about himself insofar as he tells his story as a story of the church. To this intertwined story, Hauerwas' story as a story of the church, through which he finds so interesting that he has been made Christian, does Anne remain outside? A fact that would render the story's other facts questionable. In the following, I would like to take Professor McKinney's challenge in two parts. First, is there something about gathered communal life that necessarily excludes the possibility of full assimilation? Second, is Stanley in Hannah's child using language, for, language from truthfulness and tragedy self-deceived? Has Professor Hauerwas's vision of the gathered church not accounted for how, the, how communal life strands and even abandons some and so bears the difficulty that undermines that vision. In the published versions of those comments we now have as the afterword to the new edition of Hannah's Child, Professor Hauerwas responds to McKinney's challenge this way. I quite frankly do not know. He concludes, the best I can do in answer to McKinney's challenge is to repeat what, what, what John Westerhoff said to me when I claimed after Anne's suicide attempt that she was absolutely alone. Westerhoff said, no, she is not. God is with her. Celebrating the remarkable work and life of our teacher, colleague, friend, and brother Stanley Hauerwas, I would like for us to think through this challenge about whether Ann Hauerwas is a difficulty for the story Professor Hauerwas wants to tell about himself and the church a story we, or I should say I, so desperately want to believe to be true, though perhaps not true, given the character of this difficulty. I take this question, initially one about self-deception, and finally a question about the limits of the goodness of the gospel, and therefore for any Hauerwasian, worth her salt, the limits of the goodness of the church, as one that demands asking. The fact that this question is raised most hauntingly by the life of Stanley Hauerwas, even though his work has pressed it going on five decades now, is surely God's good humor in showing us once again that ad hominem arguments do indeed matter for Christian theology. Part one, the difficult gift of Anne Hauerwas. In that afterword to Hannah's child, Professor Hauerwas turns to the philosopher Stanley Cavell in order to treat themes of pain raised by life with Anne. He finds Cavell helpful for identifying the kind of difficulty we confront in the mentally ill, those who have been ruled out of our world and the pain of realizing they have been ruled out. For Cavell, there is a small difference, a difference that sits on a pin's head of grammar between being in and being out. And one's fate has everything to do with one's ability to mean what we say when one says what they say. For Hauerwas, part of the difficulty is that the very resources we have to understand our lives are not available for those who suffer from mental illness. 
He writes, The mentally ill may have shattered lives, but how that is different from the way sin distorts our ability to comprehend who we are as God's creatures is not clear. End quote. And so vice versa. Because the proximity between the ability and inability to mean what we say, between being in and being out, between normality and madness, is closer than we care to admit. This proximity makes appellations of madness all the more terrifying, since being close but not inside another's world means one just might have the capacity to recognize she has been ruled out. Richard Fleming refers to Cavell's ordinary language thought as a philosophy of constraints and entailments. For it is by the logical constraint and entailment of our words that we can mean anything at all. Like Cavell before him, Fleming draws on J.L. Austin's essay, A Plea for Excuses, regarding what we should say when and so why and what we should mean by it. Because specific words are used for specific things and not others, because we know to do this and not that when this versus that happens, because we must mean what we say because what we say has been given meaning before our saying it, then constraint makes possible meaning, and so our wording of the world and our mutual attunement in it. However, while these constraints entail some things, they by necessity constrain other things. That our language is enabled by constraint and entailment means that if you use your words for purposes unrecognized or unaccepted, if you don't know what to do when, when someone does this versus that, or you hear this as that and not this, or you don't mean what we mean when you say what it is you say, well, then you're in trouble. The world is our word, Fleming says, by which he means the world is held together by linguistic constraints and entailments populating the natural conventions of the human form of life. This also means some will not fit with us. That a world of constraints and entailments will rule some uses out, leaving them on the outside looking in. We will not have words for them except those words which speculate what it must mean to be them, to be outside. In the Excuses essay, Austin wrote, quote, however well equipped our language, it can never be forearmed against all possible cases that may arise and call for description. Fact is richer than diction. We might call Anne Hauerwas a fact that is richer than diction. A reality that outpaces our ability to describe it. We can supply concepts that try to compensate for the lag between fact and diction, gestures like the mentally ill for a vast stretch of phenomena, but for their slippages, someone will surely pay a price. Anne's life with Stanley is one such price, and she pays it alone. I did not say that Stanley's life with Anne is that price, the cost there lies elsewhere, and I will get to it. That we can mean what we say is language's most amazing trait. That we are not fated to do so is its most brutal trait. Leaving some alienated from their words. These people come to mean things by their words they cannot possibly mean. They mean by their words things they should not mean. When they consistently fall short of knowing what to do when, then it becomes apparent that they don't occupy the same wor world of meaning as we. And when they go on to insist that they do occupy the same world, 
And when this insistence continues, well then, we are all in trouble. Things become very difficult. Fleming describes this difficulty. He writes, recognition of the distance between saying and meaning creates confusion about whether we can and how we can mean anything. A loss of control of our words, which is inevitable, because it comes, because, which is inevitable, part of the, I'm sorry, a loss of control of our words, which is inevitable, part of our talk, because our words leave us on their saying. This threatens the loss of ourselves and madness. This is not a pleasant implication for the disciplined mind. Since the health of the human spirit is being entrusted to ordinary language controls rather than to the transcendent truths or gods of a discipline or culture. It is far easier to embrace the intoxication brought by the latter than to face the sobriety of the former. Not knowing how to mean or say what we wish naturally numbs us, reintroduces silence, and places the necessity of beginning again before us. About much of what Anne is given to saying in Hannah's Child, we think to ourselves, she cannot mean what she says. She cannot mean what she says when she says she is in love with a celibate priest. She must not know what love or celibacy mean. And yet she does mean it. She cannot mean what she says when she says her deceased mother is using wallpaper to communicate with her but she does mean it. She cannot mean what she says when she says Adam cannot go and receive the sacrament. She means it. That she does is to us what is maddening about her. That we keep insisting to her that she does not is to her what I imagine is maddening about us. Coming to terms with the human requirement that we mean what we say enables readers of Hannah's Child to appreciate Anne's difficulty, the price of her life with Stanley, as one of detachment from words. A detachment that must have left her with an awful longing for connection. No wonder she fell in love so often. How sad it must be to fall in love with someone who cannot share your world someone who cannot make sense of your love, much less reciprocate it. Doubly sad that Anne could not, by the strictures of her illness, share any world with any person who could hold her to meaning what she said when she said she was in love. And so the sense of entrapment on the one hand and isolation on the other descending into increasing and unending loneliness as detachment from words plays itself out in silence. Juxtapose this loneliness and silence with the friendship that Adam and his father shared, one so intimate that Professor Hauerwas worried it might excommunicate Anne. And then the breadth and depth of friendships they had in the church. Aaron Defoe Hunter portrays the contrast vividly when she observes of Professor Harawas, one of the things that strikes me about the difference from your life and Anne's is the excruciating loneliness of it. It's such a contrast to read about your life and the fullness of your life with friends, that you, your life has been made possible, that you've been held by friends. In Stanley and Anne Harawas, we see played out right before us what I have called, reflecting on ordinary language, the amazing and brutal traits of our life in words. Stanley doing so much with words and increasingly caught up of the, in the silence of detachment from words. On several occasions, 
Stanley has confessed that he sought from Anne the words, I know this is hard. Thanks for sticking with it. Of course he would want that. Any of us would. Inhabiting a common discursive world means, for Austin, knowing what to do when. When someone suffers with, for, and because of you, I know this is hard, thanks for sticking with it, is not much, but one can see how it could become everything. It is good and right to want that acknowledgement. Those inhabiting the same moral spaces we know to say that or something like it. But this is precisely the kind of thing that Anne could not say. And her inability to do so exhibited the extent to which she had become alienated from our words. Stanley's unremitting desire to hear those words, the expectation that they occupy the same space, for how could they not, must have been agonizing. That unanswered desire could not last, or at least it did not. Its end came with the recognition that Anne had gone off to a place from which she could not return. And to that, Stanley finally relented. I'm not coming. And so the price of Stanley's life with Anne. One might object to my casting the difficulty of Anne as a difficulty of our common life in words by saying, yes, but isn't the difficulty really there in her biochemistry? Maybe, but the strangeness of Anne is not one of biochemistry, even if biochemistry may have something to do with her behavior. It is her behavior that is strange to us, her biochemistry, but our attempt to account for that strangeness. To be sure, psychotropic disorders like bipolar illness have their biochemical reasons, but those reasons do not get at what is so difficult about living with bipolar illness. Our struggle is not with biochemistry, but with persons whose biochemistries have been made to matter by what they say and do. Hence, Professor Hauerwas's rhetorical question as to what mental is doing in the locution, mental illness. We are tempted toward a concept of mind without bodies, and so imagine biochemistry, brain processes, and mental states as foundations of human being. There it is, there's the source of the difficulty in the chemicals responding, responsible for controlling the functions of the brain, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And this ironic disembodiment goes further, locating the root of these issues in genetics and so of conditions that socially trigger bipolar illness and its telltale episodes. Perhaps less bewitched would be Hannah's child as a book of biochemistry. As Wittgenstein wrote in the investigations, is it the body that feels pain? How is it to be decided? How does it become clear that it is not the body? Well, something like this. If someone has pain in his hand, then the hand does not say so unless it writes it, and one does not comfort the hand, but the sufferer. One looks into the eyes. According to Cavell, in acknowledging pain, we acknowledge persons in pain. According to Stanley, it was the anger, not the illness, that finally exhausted me. If one part of Professor McKinney's challenge is the question of whether exclusion from community is unavoidable, I'm afraid the answer is yes, for the most part. McKinney's challenge read through Austin tells us that there are some things or persons or facts or aspects that a community's words simply cannot imagine. This in no way absolves communities of the responsibility that their languages require 
including Christian communities for whom linguistic availability seems a natural entailment of the inhabitation of the word made flesh. It's only that the responsibility of one's words requires the maintenance of sense, ruling some uses out. Think here of how some ascriptions some gave for Jesus, use of, uses of words like Emmanuel, drunkard, glutton, Messiah, Beelzebul, King of the Jews, these uses didn't quite work out. This doesn't mean that a community can never fashion the words, but just that it has not. Maybe some other set of speakers will, just not the present one. Think here of how some ascriptions some gave for Jesus, Emmanuel, Messiah, King of the Jews, have taken root. For Professor Hauerwas's theological ethics, there is an important parallel, which we might call being on the wrong side of the church's constraints and entailments. The cultural linguistic appropriation of Wittgenstein that Hauerwas's thick account of church so powerfully advances will, on the flip side, necessarily constrain what the church can say. Following John Howard Yoder, Professor Hauerwas believes that the politics of Jesus entails Christological pacifism. But that belief can't help constrain certain Christian speech, detaching some from the very words they claim, leaving them with little to say that doesn't sound crazy within a church so thickened. For not a few Hauerwasians, I suspect, this is precisely the point, holding forth criteria that force some judgments out. It goes something like this. Given our liturgy, you can't possibly mean that. To be sure, the outing goes both ways. But for us Christian pacifists, speaking well without sounding patronizing of brothers and sisters tied to the military becomes very tricky. And so for any number of issues in the church's rush to community, as Peter Dula so aptly characterizes it, while much of this comes with the territory, Christian community is thick with constraints and entailments. I imagine by rush, Peter means to indicate that Harawasians have rarely taken stock of what thickness costs, but only what it gains. Part two, the difficult gift of the church. I've tried to show that insofar as we are gathered through mutual attunement in language, and insofar as Anne spoke in ways we could not make sense of, she remained beyond us. But this doesn't make her absurd. It just makes her human. That is, someone who shares in our human life of words. This is true even if her share issued without sense. This answers one part of McKinney's challenge. The other part is whether she is absurd to the particular story Stanley Hauerwas wants to tell. So let me restate the challenge in those terms then. Is Stanley self-deceived about the role Anne, Anne Hauerwas plays in his story? Is it, is she, as McKinney put it, the sir that resists your story, refusing to be assimilated into it, and therefore reminding you of the limits of any account of Christian discipleship, including yours? If the answer is yes, if Anne is an intractable argument against my theology, as Professor Hauerwas understood the challenge, then he is self-deceived insofar as he unwittingly set himself up for McKinney's conclusion. My sense is she is the sir that resists your story, and you did not really let her play that role. I take this question about self-deception, there's another one to follow, about the church's ability to assimilate Anne as but a more personal version of the one often put to Professor Harawas regarding whether the church he heralds is actual or mainly rhetorical, mythical, or tropic. In, an, uh, in analytic terms, 
We can imagine someone without McKinney's subtlety of mind using Anne as a defeater case that proves Hauerwas's church theory invalid. As should be clear by now, I think Austin gives us reasons to, to doubt both that argument and that kind of argument. If anything, I think Anne's role in the story makes for a richer because more chastened account of the church triumphant. If we ever took Professor Hauerwas as trumpeting a church, assimilating all difficulties to itself, such that those difficulties end up less than difficult, we have misunderstood him. The church he speaks of is exceedingly difficult. And unless we can receive it as such, we will not have it as the gift he imagines it to be. I'll turn to this in a minute. Before doing so, I should say something about another kind of self-deception threatened by Anne Hauerwas. This would be the basic one where Professor Hauerwas narrates Anne in a way that deceives us about her history. Not because he has out and out lied, but because he relates only his version of events. The concern here is that Anne Hauerwas is not able to read Hannah's child and alert us to when she is being misrepresented. Because of her death, there is no counter narrative to Hannah's child. We might even say that because of Anne's illness, she could provide nothing even approaching what we would recognize as a counter narrative. It's all made just to sound crazy. In those fuller lectures on mental illness, it did not take long for someone to raise this very question. Precisely the question was this. We've heard a great deal over the period of three lectures about somebody none of us knows. And the only narration we have is your narration. And I know through your writings that you are a morally sensitive theologian who would have seen from the beginning the ethical issues there about narrating somebody's life who cannot speak for themselves. Hauerwas responded. He said, I knew I couldn't write about it until after she was dead. I never talked about Anne, much less wrote about her after she left because of exactly the point you make. Because I am articulate and had a power to articulate her life against which she was defenseless, there could be a violence in that that I certainly wanted to avoid. So I just didn't say anything. I felt very much the problem you articulate of not wanting to write about her in a way that didn't invite possible counter narratives. The only answer I can give is that I hope I have done an honest job of narrating her in a manner that doesn't make her the enemy. I think here, we should simply acknowledge that Anne, whoever she was, including the possibility that she was not the person given to us in Hannah's child, is not here. And so to judge whether her story was truthfully told is presently not within our powers. I think it is enough to say that, the, that Hannah's child, as the title suggests, is Stanley Hauerwas's story, not that of Anne Hauerwas. And that Stanley could not tell Stanley Hauerwas's story without including his story about Anne. I also want to say that his telling his story as a story that has to include Anne, makes for a story rich enough to at least name this temptation as a temptation. I'll get to what I mean here by returning to that first kind of self-deception I previously discussed. Remember that I said that for Professor Hauerwas, the story he tells of himself in Hannah's Child is a story of the church, insofar as by the end of the book, he finds the church has made him Christian. And so the story he tells of himself and the story he tells of the church are intertwined. The truthfulness of one bears on the truthfulness of the other, or at least it would seem to for the one who intertwines these stories. So as to the matter of whether Professor Harawas is self-deceived about the church, 
and hence whether Anne proves an intractable argument against the church he has spent his career, champ his career championing, is he self-deceived? My answer is this. The presence of Anne Harawas in his life tells us that the church Professor Harawas imagines Israel promising, Christ establishing, the Holy Spirit enabling, and God completing is a gift difficult to bear. At his best, he has spent his whole career saying this. Introducing truthfulness and tragedy, the book Nancy Murphy cleverly quoted from when reinstating McKinney's challenge, Professor Hauerwas wrote, my basic thesis here is contained in the title Truthfulness and Tragedy. For a truthful narrative is one that gives us the means to accept the tragic without succumbing to self-deceiving explanations. Additionally, his famous essay with David Burrell on the Nazi Albert Spears states, self-deception is correlative with trying to exist in this life without a story sufficiently substantive and rich to sustain us in the unavoidable challenges that confront the self. I see Stanley's life with Anne as the constant reminder that no matter how wonderful the church God in Christ established, it is in as much as it is the sacramental presence of the crucified Christ, a gift almost impossible to bear. Though I would love to see the various brutalities recounted in Hannah's Child finally put to rest, every accusation that Harawas is a sectarian fideist caught up in premature, eschatological inspired fantasies, I'm a realist when it comes to the state of contemporary theology. But for me, I can't read Hannah's Child and not see that for Stanley, church is a gift bearing the difficulty of reality. Is Anne Harawas a difficulty in the story he wants to tell about the church? Undoubtedly. Is she a difficulty for that story? I'm not sure how to answer this question, for it begs what one means by that story. If one understands Stanley's account of the church as one that can justify everything, well then, we would have to admit that Anne is absurd. But that admission would be about as dull as that story. But what if one imagined the story otherwise? Not as destabilized by surds, but as itself surd-like. A story that by its very calculus of our entailments and constraints could not arrive but as random and unexplainable. What if the story is told in such a way that Anne becomes strangely consonant with the story's surd-like cadence? making Anne hardly stranger than that which Christ ordained through the vicar of the church. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. We can grant that Christian speech, like all speech, has its necessary entailments and constraints, and we can grant that these entailments and constraints assign some to play the role of outsider. But none of that should be a problem for those who find themselves inside a story where random and unexplained events have been ordained as the norm. Ours is an adventure of irrational, unaccounted for, and even, even meaningless twists and turns, which the Christian word grace is not meant to straighten out, but name. Of course, knowing all this will not make life any easier, just like knowing something about biochemistry will not give us handles on the persons we live with. When knowing gives out and explanations reach bedrock, the skill that will benefit us is narrating the church in a manner that can hold together the church's entailed hope and the difficulty of its constraints. 
in an uncanny way, Stanley Hauerwas is possessed of this skill. And more uncanny still is how his life has been made to display its manner. As one way of developing what I have in mind here, let me read two different notes Stanley made related to Anne and Adam. The first comes from his earliest book, the 1974 Vision and Virtue. At the time, he wrote, my most important friends have been my wife, Anne, and my son, Adam. Together, they have taught me most of what I have learned about what makes life worthwhile and joyful. They are gifts I cannot possess and all the more valuable because of it. I thank God for them. In a book that argues that the goodness of persons is not automatic, but must be acquired and cultivated, Stanley credits Anne and Adam as his most important teachers. At that time, the severity of Anne's illness was still coming into view. This might have been one of those claims one makes before one knows what one is claiming. However, 12 years later, by the time ambiguity had given way to cruelty, in the 1986 Suffering Presence, Stanley writes in that preface, as always, I owe Anne and Adam everything for they literally make my life possible. They suffer my presence day in and day out. I might add, not without a bit of impatience for my considerable shortcomings, but also always with love. With their presence, I am gifted beyond measure. It is significant that in that particular book, Stanley writes about pain and what he writes about pain takes on a different light, given what we now know about his life with Anne at the time of the writing. He wrote, when we are in pain, we want to be helped. But it is exactly at this point that one of the strangest aspects of our being in pain occurs. Namely, it is impossible for us to experience one another's pain. That does not mean we cannot communicate to one another her pain. That we can do. But what cannot be done is for you to understand and or experience my pain as mine. This puts us under a double burden because we have enough of a problem learning to know one another in the normal aspects of our lives. But when we are in pain, our alienation from one another only increases. For no matter how sympathetic we may be to the other in pain, that very pain creates a history and experience that makes the other just that much more foreign to me. Our pains isolate us from one another, and they create worlds that cut us off from one another. This experience of stories we cannot share Stanley calls the quite common, but all the more extraordinary aspect of our existence. I view these words about unpossessable gifts and patient forbearance as describing how Stanley has tried to understand the Christian conception of gift. What we ought to notice is the proximity of gift to pain in these accounts. Was Stanley unclear about the extent of Anne's illness in 1974? Probably. But in 1986, when he described Anne as a gift beyond measure, was he self-deceived about what was going on with Anne? I doubt it. Rather, he is claiming that gift for Christians is structured in a very particular way, where gift remains ever proximate to pain. In Truthfulness and Tragedy, Stanley names a persistent temptation for Christian ethical reflection. The, quote, attempt to let us have our moral commitments without willing the tragedies they necessarily involve, end quote. And what I want to conclude is that the goodness of Stanley Hauerwas's theology is that it teaches us how to wait for God. <laughs> 
and God started light coming. I stopped short of using the word tragedy here as Stanley did there because while I can see how tragedy registers something important, I fear referring to things as tragic obscures something about the kinds of creatures we are, as I've tried to intimate by my brief excursus on ordinary language. I don't want to say that Anne Harawas was a tragic part of Stanley Harawas's story. I want to say she was, is, and remains part of that story. That the story of Stanley Harawas can't be told without entailing something about Anne Harawas. That the difficulty of Anne Harawas, it seems to me, is not that she cannot be so easily integrated into the story Stanley wants to tell. Rather, the difficulty of Anne Harawas is that the story Stanley wants to tell will always entail such difficulties. The church of Stanley Harawas necessarily involves Anne Harawas. It is constrained in just this way. It entails these kinds of features. The entailment of such difficulties constrains what can be presumed about the church's ability to render difficulties less difficult. And yet, the church is called to do just that, render some difficulties less difficult. It is just that the church in time does not know which of the difficulties she is called to carry will be made less burdensome and which will not. All she knows is that she is to carry the burdens given to her. She has to presume that the Holy Spirit is making all things new, and so swords are being made into plowshares, and leopards lay down with the kid. But that doesn't mean everything will be made new in this time. Every weapon made to feed. That every kid will survive. But it might. And this might has been enabled. Right up to the end, Anne Harawas might have been made well. And that was part of the difficulty. And hence why it was right for Stanley to want those words and so agonizing when they did not come. Or it might be that everything is presently being made new yet in ways not readily apparent to us. Part of the gift of Anne Harawas and so many difficulties we discover along the way is how these gifts ground every aspiration the church might have for itself. Demonstrating Christian discipleship includes at least two things, the work of redemption and the work of redemption when redemption comes slowly. On this point, I cannot help thinking that Anne Harawas has been, rather than a defeater to Stanley's theology, the subtext that fashions its most subtle contours. Think for a minute who else occupies his stories. Uncle Charlie, Martha, Pipkin, his young friend Bob, Mrs. Prouty, Ian Bedlow, Job and his friends, Israel, the Apostle Paul, and Jesus of Nazareth. Or recall those masterful Harawas one-liners. Christian discipleship is extended training in how to die well and early. Martyrdom is the church's most determinative form of witness. Raising your children Christian means raising them to suffer. The courageous have fears that cowards never know. What do you mean we, white man? <laughs> Harawas' rule, you always marry the wrong person. And even more daunting, you always marry the right person. Consider the arguments that modern medicine is premised on the lie that we can get out of this life alive. That liberalism's reliance on the state is an indictment on the church's failure to be church. That consequentialist and deontological normativity 
is what you do when you lack character. And if you've come to seminary to find that character, it's too late for you. <laughs> that, as he wrote, Christ's life and crucifixion, Christ's life and crucifixion are necessary to purge us of false notions about what kind of kingdom Jesus brings. End quote. These are difficult matters, difficult demands. While it is true that we modern, <coughs> while it is true that we moderns live by the presumption that you should have no story other than the story you chose when you had no story, living the church's story, to use one of Stanley's favorite metaphors, is no bowl of cherries either. I worry that too often Stanley has been read by Harawasians and anti Harawasians as like as suggesting a triumphless narrative to which Anne Harawas can only be absurd in that dull sense, a defeater in the philosophical parlor games we are wont to play. Whereas it seems to me that the story to which Stanley keeps pointing us over and against our proclivities to make it dull is the story of the church and its promise and wonder, and what that promise and wonder necessarily entail and constrain in the very logic of its grammar. If the Ann Harawasses of the world were defeaters on the storied salvation we call church, well then, indeed it would be dull. Ann Harawas is the difficulty of that story, a difficulty of the church, and in this way, the Church of Stanley Harawas is a difficult gift, and only as such is it a gift. It was an incompletion to ever hear Stanley's story without hearing the role Ann played in it. Just as it's been a mistake to receive Stanley's church without its attending and necessary difficulties. This is the condition of our stories, the very possibility of any triumph we dare Christians, we Christians dare claim. If we have asserted Christian unity over and against Christian, non-Christian division, the coherence of our liturgy over and against liberalism's incoherence, or the church's peace over and against the world's violence. If we have proclaimed any of these without at least intending the difficult conditions under which that coherence, liturgy, and peace come about, the inestimable constraints and entailments, then we have yet to understand that the church's coherence, liturgy, and peace come as a sword. That the terms of the kingdom's coming is nothing less than the end of this present age. When we invoke the Eucharist in a triumphless tone, we seem to have forgotten in what way it can play a critical role in theological ethics. The Eucharist means that the incarnate God died. If for us the presence of a difficulty so difficult someone had to die makes the church's story less enticing, well then, we have missed something about that story and therefore the conditions of the resurrection it proclaims. I have, a, I have an admission to make, and maybe at the end of this talk is the only place I can make it. Prior to seminary here at Duke, I had never read a Hauerwas book. I came here for the basketball. Which is ironic because while, it, while, while I attended but a few games in my seven years at Duke, I am now an unabashed Harawasian. I today love the church Stanley speaks of almost as much as I love basketball. Which sounds like a statement about my idolatries, but it really is a profession of my love for the church. For me, and I think for so many of the students that came before and after me, I found in Stanley a powerful articulation of what the church had to be given what scripture said it was. Before ever reading it, I had the benefit of being introduced to a Christianity very similar to that which is offered in the Blackwell Companion to Christian Ethics, Stanley's big book written by his friends. And 
What I love most about the great gift of calling Stanley Harawas a friend and teacher. And what I imagine is most lovable about Stanley for many people in this room today is his willingness to, invoking one of those titles again, name the silences. Requiring that our sky-high theologies sit with the difficulties. To not allow academic pretense or a fluffy pietism or neat narratives to belie the fact that we Christians hold this promise, but in earthen vessels. I came to Stanley with not a lot of Hauerwas, and so certainly with not very much preparation. But I did come carrying my own difficulties, and I sensed in him a vision of church where questions often found inspiring answers, and when not, the church is a place patient enough to let questions lie, a place able to abide difficult gifts, gifts as difficult and as good as Ann Harawas, Jonathan Tran, and yes, Stanley Harawas. Thank you. Well, Jonathan, that was a hell of a paper. I know everyone out there is breathing a silent prayer of gratitude that they don't have to be the one to respond to it. Uh, so it would be a lie to say it's a delight to be here. Um, but I am grateful for uh, the invitation, Dean Hayes, and. Uh, to Zach and Carol and whoever else did all the organization, uh, and of course to Stanley Hauerwas. Um, it was uh, one of the great privileges of a very privileged life to have been a Stanley Hauerwas student. Uh, and so this place means a ton to me, and that, of course, being a Hauerwas student meant being a Hauerwas student in the company of many of you, uh, including Jonathan. Um, and so I'll, maybe I'll just share one anecdote I was sharing with Alex and Joe last night about how much this place means to me. Uh, about five years ago, uh, uh, one summer struggling mightily to try to get some writing done, uh, I tried to think back to the, how I could reproduce the conditions that enabled me to write my dissertation the last time I actually got significant writing done down there in the sub-basement of the Divinity School Library. And so uh, I painted my office the same dark metallic gray of all those colors. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, so and following uh, Charlie's lead, I need to start with a uh, Hauerwas story. Uh, that involves um, him cussing. Uh, it's a story that a lot of you have heard before, and usually I think it's tedious when people sort of shamelessly repeat their best stories, but on the occasion in honor of Hauerwas, it seems totally appropriate. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I, I first came to Duke in the spring of 1998 as a prospective student that weekend when all the um, uh, students admitted for the next year come for the weekend. And uh, there was a party at the house that Chris and Rachel Hubner used to uh, share with Peter and Amy Frickholm. And I was in the kitchen talking with Stanley and he was helping me sort out whether to come to Duke or whether to go to another school that had accepted me. And he said, well, if you go there, so-and-so will turn you into a good liberal ironist. 
And I was young and dumb and thought Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity was one of the best books I'd ever read. Uh, but I wasn't so dumb as to ask him, what's the matter with that? And instead I asked him, well, what will you turn me into? And he looked me in the eye and growled, a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately for Jonathan, here I am. <laughs> you know, I want to, uh, just kidding, man. Uh, my remarks this morning are divided into three parts. So in the first part, I want to uh, comment on Jonathan's use of ordinary language philosophy very briefly. Uh, and I don't know if it's a question for Jonathan or if it's an elaboration of what I think he's done. Second, I want to quarrel with Hauerwas's interpretation of McKinney's question, which I think Jonathan kind of takes for granted. And then third, I want to say, uh, explain just why I think this was such a great paper and what the takeaway is. So to the first one, I want to preface this also by saying that uh, Jonathan's turn, and Stanley's too, in his SC presidential address towards that set of Wittgensteinians gathered around Stanley Cavell has been a source of enormous encouragement to me, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, and not just because of the maybe dozen copies of my book on Cavell that were sold to individuals and not libraries. Ten of them were bought by Baylor students, I think. <laughs> um, Cavell, like Jonathan, is at pains to understand our separateness. But such descriptions in Cavell are invariably in service of his critiques of the ways philosophers attempt to justify or overcome that separateness. Attempts to secure connections between insides and outsides. Attempts to turn metaphysical finitude into intellectual lack to have knowledge without acknowledgement, all of which find ways to relieve us of responsibility for the other's separateness. Cavell writes, there is no assignable end to the depth of us to which language reaches, that nevertheless there is no end to our separateness. We are endlessly separate for no reason. And that sounds to me like a pretty good summary of the first half of Jonathan's paper. Then Cavell goes on and says, but then we are answerable for everything that comes between us. Now that second sentence sounds about as far as you can get from, and I'm quoting from Jonathan now, if one part of Professor McKenney's challenge is the question of whether exclusion from community is unavoidable, I'm afraid the answer is yes, for the most part." End of quote. Now, I think Jonathan is pushed in this direction, or uh, is not explicit about this, and can be excused for that, because the alternative seems to imply, and Jonathan's sitting there wondering what I'm going to do next, uh, that I'm about to say that Stanley is answerable for Anne's separateness. Now that's not exactly false, but what I mean to say is that Hannah's child is precisely an account of such answerability. And that answerability is Hauerwasian ethics. And the other reason I think Jonathan may be pushed in this direction, and this is the second part of my remarks, is that I think he takes for granted in the first part of the paper, Hauerwas's interpretation of McKenney's question. So let's get McKenney's claim in front of us. Quote, is Anne the sir that resists your story, refusing to be assimilated into it and therefore reminding you of the limits of any account of Christian discipleship? including yours. My sense is that she is the latter and you do not really let her play that role." End of quote. 
Harwas takes McKenney to be suggesting, quote, I may well not be aware of how profoundly Anne's life stands as an intractable argument against my theology. Now, I think Harwas is missled here. Is this really an account about Harwas' theology? That reads too much into the including yours and skips right over the any account. She is a sir not just to Hauerwas' theology, but to theology. And she's a sir to ordinary language philosophy too, I imagine McKinney might say. And is it really an argument? A reminder of limits is only an argument if you have a very un understanding of theology. Makes me think maybe you've been reading John Milbank again. <laughs> so I propose that the better way to understand McKenney's challenge is something like this. Tell this story in a way that acknowledges the fact that Anne doesn't fit. Tell it in a way that lets her play the role of the reminder of the limits of any account of Christian discipleship, including yours. I hope the difference I'm getting at is clear. McKinney isn't saying there's something wrong with Hauerwas' theology such that we can make a few revisions to it that would help him escape the force of the challenge to any account. He isn't asking for a more elaborate account of Christian community and formation into which Anne could be made to fit or one that can explicitly justify why she doesn't have to. The former is impossible and hence the latter is unnecessary. But what would it mean to let the truth of that sink in? How would Hauerwas' theology sound different if Anne was allowed to be a reminder of limits and not a provocation to more argument? And this leads me to the third part of my remarks. I think it would sound exactly like the second half of Jonathan's paper. I intend my rephrasing of McKinney's challenge as an account of what we just heard, where the beginning of the paper takes for granted Hauerwas' reading of McKinney, the end does not. Jonathan's conclusion is this. The difficulty of Anne Hauerwas is not that she cannot be so easily integrated into the story Stanley wants to tell. Rather, the difficulty is that the story he wants to tell always entails such difficulties. Now it seems to me he's reading the challenge much differently. He's no longer defending Hauerwas against McKinney, but performing on Hauerwas' behalf what McKinney asked, instructing us in how to read Hannah's child and Hauerwas' theology. In doing so, it seems to me that Jonathan has taught us something genuinely new about Hauerwas' theology, genuinely new, even if it was already there, waiting patiently for Jonathan to draw it out. At the heart of Jonathan's paper is this. I cannot resist thinking that Anne Hauerwas has been rather than a defeater to Stanley's theology, the subtext that fashions its most subtle contours. That's an incredible line and I think it's true. And now it's a challenge to all of us to go back and read Stanley with that in mind and to ask ourselves about the subtle contours of the theology each of us writes to ensure that our work has such contours, whether as personal as friends suffering from mental illness, family members with addiction or anorexia, or as structural as the Vietnam War, the legacy of slavery, the fact of patriarchy, or the perpetual war that we are now in. Now, not only has Jonathan exposed something overlooked, it seems to me that he has enacted it. Notice how the very fact of Jonathan's paper attests to its central claim. The argument is that if you are going to journey with this church, the church articulated by Stanley Hauerwas, then you are committing yourself to confrontation with this kind of pain, refusing to avoid it 
but instead to bear it alongside others. That's what the paper said, but the evidence is not in the footnotes. The evidence is the simple fact of the paper. I confess I really did not want to talk about Ann Hauerwas this morning. I would very much have welcomed the opportunity to avoid that topic. And I would like to avoid it for a number of reasons. Many, perhaps all, of which make for the way, quote, our pains isolate us from one another, to cite Jonathan citing Hauerwas. Pain doesn't isolate us all by itself. We make choices or have choices made for us about our pain that are isolating. Choices of avoidance that Jonathan has ruled out because prompted by McKenney's question, he has discovered something about Hauerwas's church and is willing to publicly take the risk that confronted with what he discovered, we will react in recognition. Finally, it follows that there are consequences to failing to read Hauerwas properly. And most worrisome is the way Hauerwas, quote, has been read by Hauerwasians and anti-Hauerwasians alike as suggesting a triumphalist narrative. This is a concern that Jonathan, I suspect, has always been sensitive to. But in light of his reading of Hannah's Child, one that we are now forced to take more seriously than we perhaps have, Jonathan writes, if we have asserted Christian unity over against Christian division, the coherence of our liturgy over against liberalism's incoherence, or the church's peace over against the world's violence, while downplaying the costs and difficulties, we have misread something about this story. And the first time I read over that, sort of basking in the lyrical warmth of Jonathan's ending, I just sort of skated right over it. Yeah, if we've done that. Second time, I had to stifle a snort. Jonathan knows very well that Stanley has, on occasion, done all these things. And that we, his students, have also done all these things. Some more than others, and few less than Jonathan himself, but we've done them. Not as often, and not in the ways that James Gustafson and Jeff Stout think we have, but we've done them. And if we truly learn from Jonathan's paper, we will do so less often but that will make us more, not less, Howard Waston. So in closing, I want to say just one quick word of gratitude to Stanley. The topic has come up both in Jennifer and Charlie's talks about Howard Waston's claim that he had to become a pacifist because he's such a violent person, or as he puts it near the end of Hannah's Child, Quote, I have to tell people I am committed to Christian nonviolence because my life so belies that conviction. You do, not, you do not have to be around me long to know that I am not exactly a peaceable guy. The question of self-deception in this memoir was raised several times in Jonathan's presentation. Here I raise it not as a question, but as an accusation. I know your public persona and I have not completely forgotten the times you've gotten frustrated with me for saying something too stupid or too liberal. Sometimes both. <laughs> but to claim that you are not a peaceable guy seems to me a profoundly misleading account of the man who lived with Anne all those years, raised Adam, mourned Anne's departure, loves Paula with a love that would make a lot of wives jealous befriended so many academic colleagues, some of them very questionable, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and taught, mentored, advised, counseled, and even fathered a lot of us in this room. Thank you very much. extraordinary quality of this conversation 
is testimony to the extraordinary quality of the man we are celebrating here today and to his influence on us all. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Peter, for these remarkable papers, these insightful words that help us understand more deeply the difference that Christ makes. We look forward to continuing this conversation this afternoon.